So hello link 341 uh, back again at the dimension number four. So for the dimension number four, uh, we have aperture. Aperture means an opening. The alternative term can be the degree of constriction because when the air passes your uh, trachea, larynx and it enters the vocal uh, tract, you are making certain degree of aperture with your articulators and the type of the sound created by a constriction of, of the vocal tract depends on how narrow the constriction is basically. So how uh, big the aperture is, uh, how big you open certain parts of the mouth and what to do with, it, with your tongue mainly because tongue is the most important here. Um, and we're going to walk through uh, these uh, types of sounds. Uh, the first uh, in line are stops. So are stops. So um, for the most narrow or the or the least uh, yeah for the most narrow constriction, there are sounds. There are sounds. There are stops. Um, stops are produced by complete by doing a complete closure of the articulators or the airstream cannot escape through your mouth so it does not have any space so articulators are disabling the airstream escape through uh, the mouth uh, another term uh, for these is uh, plosive uh, or plosives which focuses which is the term that focuses on the consequences of the release of the sound. So, for example, if you're making a P sound, you're attracting the airflow with your lips, like this. And once the lips are spread apart, the, the rush of air comes out as if it's, it's an explosion, right? It has that kind of a explosive feature. So, um, hence the name, right? Explosive. But otherwise, you can think of them as stops. Um, for fricatives, or the second in this on this list, are fricatives. Fricatives are produced with a very close approximation of two articulators, so very close, not complete closure, and um, the airstream mechanism is practically obstructed, and the turbulent airflow is produced as a result. This mechanism is similar. To making slightly hissing sounds that, for example, wind produces, such as you know, like and so on and so forth. To remember what a fricative is, you can think about the airflow ca causing friction because it needs to go through a narrow channel. So there is some kind of a friction through a narrow channel caused by the air, uh, by the molecules of air uh, that travel through your vocal tract. And uh, we've already um, done uh we've already mentioned a clear example of, of fricatives like s or z sh um you know it sounds like a noise so um this is our second option uh a bit open and fricative so uh we are going to keep track uh, or keep score once again so we have aperture stops and fricatives as our options. Stops are produced with a complete closure of the articulators and fricatives with a narrow closure or narrow channel uh, that creates tur turbulence. Now we come to English stops. Uh, with respect to English stops, um, we have voiceless and voiced. Um, and by their place of articulation, they can be bilabials, they can be alveolars, and they can be velar. Um, and of course, there is also a glow, glow one, which I'm going to um, uh, mention here. Um, we all know P and B by labels with both lips produced alveolars T and D. They're still stops because we are stopping the airflow completely with some articulators and velars K and G. Uh, we are also stopping the airflow with the back of our tongue. Uh, hitting the roof of the mouth and the uh, glottal in the end glottal, glottal is a the status of a glottal stop in english is questionable because its distribution is limited 
uh, where other consonants may have a uh, variety of positions in, in words, the glottal stop can only appear at the beginning of words as a phoneme and not a, as an allophone. Because if you remember, it appears in button, mitten, as an allophone, but we're talking about a phoneme. It can surface in words such as um, east or eek or ark um, and so on and so forth. It's usually there to replace this vowel in a longer sequence of vowels, which are not different according to their height or frontness. So in the word eek, um, for example, you might have a glottal stop at the beginning in the word eek, right, like this. So you might have something like this. It should be e, but that's okay, eek. And that's just because of the ease of articulation. It's very easy to say bike or bile because a uh, is a low vowel and you go from a low to a high vowel and if you're going from e to e then you have some kind of a of a problem there because it's uh, more difficult to say this it's uh, like saying um, two m's in a word for example uh, boom m, m, me boom me it's it's very difficult to differentiate between these two so uh, we have some kind of uh, apparatus uh, that works for us and that's the glottal closure you know the closure of the glot of the of the vocal folds in order to produce this glottal stop such as in button or mitten in especially in um, British English all right so we have uh, balayabils alveolars velars and glottal and note that stops uh, that follow a vowel involve a closing gesture um, and stops that precede the vowel involve an opening gesture. Uh, so stops behave differently in different contexts. Uh, nothing new there. Most of the sounds uh, do the same. But if you produce a stop after a vowel, as in up or top, there is a closing gesture. There's a closing gesture, while if a stop precedes a vowel, there's an opening gesture as well. So you close and open, right? Um, and I guess that's logical. With that in mind, stops at the end of the words may be unreleased. Example is from one of your um, exercises, like chocolate pudding, chocolate pudding, right? And um, for the unreleased, um, uh, sounds, we have this diacritic above the, the sounds. For example, t, okay? We have this kind of a angle here li in, in with two lines, right? Um, written as in chocolate pudding. And if you just carefully produce it as in chocolate pudding, you kind of get that it's being swall swallowed by this p here and um, it's not released. There is no release of air. Chocolate, chocolate, right? Like in, like if you say chocolate, so there is no release in this case. Um, and I'll show that in on the next slide. Uh, let me show you in broad how this looks like. So this is a chocolate pudding. Um, Chocolate pudding. Recording and chocolate pudding. This person is producing chocolate. Chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. Without without releasing the stop. This type stop kind of blends into p, 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 p later. And uh, because of this p and the influence of p upon the t, there is no release. Okay, so you can, as I said, write this uh, unreleased with uh, the symbol for uh, the unreleased one, which I showed you in on your on the previous slide. Chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. Okay. 
yeah, sometimes I have to mention that uh, some speakers would produce here a goal stop, which would also be empty, right? Um, so goal stop doesn't have any any voice here, any noise because of the stoppage of the airflow by the by the vocal fold. So uh, that's how you can sometimes also um, detect glow stop on this uh, uh, maybe rather on this spectrogram here below in this part here. Okay, so yeah, that would be chocolate pudding. Okay, the next up are fricatives. Um, fricatives are can be voiceless and voiced. They can be labiodental, interdental, alveolars, and postalveolars and glow glow fricatives. So we have labiodental fricatives uh, produced with our lips and teeth. So uh, lower lip and upper teeth, like f and v, then. Uh, tongue between the teeth, interdental like th and th, alveolars uh, and z, and postalveolars sh and z. Uh, these um, are these have higher frequencies. That is, they have higher energy like sh and z, s and z, and they're more, you know, in a way, more hissing sounds. So they they're sometimes called sibilants, right? So sibilants. Um, with respect to H, which is a glottal fricative here, it's just the air that is pushed out of your lungs with the opening of the vocal fold. So basically, and that's it. You have it there, like house um, hit and so on and so forth. That's why this symbol is also used as a diacritic for aspiration, you know, like, I don't know, maybe p, 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 because of the, this puff of air. And I think you, yeah, you get the, the gist. Um, so we went from a gesture that completely closes the vocal tract to a bit narrow passage and we have come to the most open passage or to the lowest degree of constriction to approximants. So approximants are speech sounds with, that are made with a gesture in which one articulator comes close to another, but without the vocal tract being, being too narrow to or being narrowed down to such an extent that the turbulent airstream is produced. So we don't have this turbulence and friction because it's not so narrow, you know? The, the, the gesture that we make with one articulator to another does not make this uh, narrow channel. And um, I'll show you which approximates we have in English. Lastly, we come to affricates, uh, which are a combination of a stop and a fricative, so they uh, maybe don't belong in this dimension, but we don't have where to put them, so uh, these are a combination of stops, which are first on the list and uh, fricatives second on the list, so yeah, it it is kind of logical to for them to be here. Um, uh, we have uh, affricates in words such as church, tree, uh, and for these sounds, the tongue tip is, uh, or the blade, hit the postal velar ridge. So tongue tip hit, hit, hits the postal velar ridge, which makes a stop. And instead of coming fully apart, then you know after a stop, like in t t, uh, they separate only slightly. You know, sh, so that the fricative is made at approximately the same place of articulation. So that's where they differ from stops because they don't come um, fully apart like stops, but they separate only slightly from the, the roof of the mouth, okay? In order to make this uh, noise or turbulence. Um, y is a uh, palatal palatal approximant so you is a, an approximant 
an example of an approximate and if you say yes and before saying the whole word a word you should you should just say yeah yeah uh, you're raising your tongue towards the palate but not to, to the extent to get a palatal fricative there are no palatal fricatives in english perhaps in british english or in australian english when they are producing uh, words such as hue um, in fact you, you can try producing these like that for example you can say yeah yeah as in yes yeah and then try and raising your tongue a little bit to create a narrow uh, friction as in right so you have it there and this is a sound that might be produced in some parts or some varieties of England or English uh, varieties such as uh, what you're doing there Hugh instead of saying your full name like I don't know Hugh right <laughs> Like in regular English, right? Okay, so um, th there's a difference between the uh, palatal approximant and a palatal fricative, and that's where the approximants and fricatives differ. Um, yeah, for uh, th there is uh, an another one. Yeah, one one thing I have to mention as well that you should take a look at your course book and try to draw this mid mid sagittal diagram. You know those diagrams that we. Uh, uh, drew for some of our um, speech sounds so something like this you know um, where well, I don't know this is a tongue and larynx and uh, vocal folds so this is a mid sagittal diagram on spot um, not the best one but yeah okay so, good enough. Um, yeah, maybe I can do like teeth and lips. Uh, and then there is nose, right? Oh, awful, but I'm I'm uh, drawing this on computer on in this PPT presentation. So, um, you should you should try and be better than this. Anyways, you have to indicate where the tongue hits the uh, the the roof of the mouth for many of for the majority of the speech sounds and this is not you so not you not a year sound so pay attention to that it's just it's just something i drew maybe it's likely to or the whatever um but you should pay attention to how to draw this sound uh in comparison to sh okay you'll have this for your homework um, then the next one is what what is a voice to labiovelar uh, the approximate is produced at two places of articulation so there are two places of articulation the first one uh, are the lips and the second one is the velum or the soft palate whereby the tongue is hitting the velo, right? So this speech sound is actually a consonantal version of oo, for example, because you're when you're producing oo, and if you just hit the velo with your back of the tongue, then you will uh, like something like this, you know, here, or maybe yeah, here you will produce wa. Wah, wah. and there is the rounding, rounding of the lips which is quite prominent in wa. Um the final one is lateral approximate so uh, this is this is a lateral which I'm going to mention on the on one of the next slides so I don't want to dwell on it right now but make sure to write in your exercises that this is a lateral approximate right sound okay uh, some dialects of English will distinguish between which and which which is a, which is a fricative so pay attention to that uh, the this one to the right is fricative 
and this one to the left is an approximant and uh, we produce the one to the right by saying which which as if you're producing and what afterwards so which which um, some people I've heard in Canada do this uh, yeah, I don't think they know about it but they do this if you you know for example dr. pounder is uh, popular for doing that I, I mean it's just the way you speak right something um, it's perfectly normal but uh, you might notice this with some people um, and the origin of which or this sound is in English is actually stemming from the old English and you can uh, take a look at the old English writing for for example uh, the word uh, I think this should be the word wheel wheel which would be produced in the old English uh, as whale whale right and there you go there you have this fricative um, okay so I um, just wanted to point to this difference and you should perhaps try and produce some of these such as which and which and uh, try to listen to some people producing these uh, maybe you uh, you will capture the difference even younger speakers today I believe there are uh, those speakers who do this uh, today um, okay and we have uh, of course yeah this is a voiceless labio velar approximant and yeah no sorry that that was a mistake so I, I think this should be a fricative okay um, finally we have voiced j and ch which are the two affricates you produce in words such as tree or gym or gin and so on and so forth um, if you want to be really narrow technically um, these sounds such as ch and j are produced at the postal velar ridge and the t in ch and d in j might be a little back in the mouth because of that right because of this uh, place of articulation which is generally post alveolar and if you want to be really narrow you can transcribe it with this underscore for uh, the posterior posterior sound or back sound right um, yeah so an interesting question that I would normally ask in a class is how you say tree and draw because t and d underlyingly um, can become affricates and this process is called affrication this only occurs when they are found before er this retroflex and if uh, so if you produce these without any aspiration then you will produce the affricated versions of of, of t if you produce these with affrication then you are going to produce these uh, with but uh, without being affricated so um, in case of uh, for example maybe this one affricate uh, sorry uh, aspirated affricate you have no affrication so no affrication and yeah I'll just write it like this um, no affrication no this process but this is still an Africa sound right so don't don't confuse these two um, there are children who learn um, to write very early on uh, even before they can learn to uh, really you know do some other cognitive stuff um, and those children might write down instead of dragon they might write down like this dragon right with a J uh, please do not do this in the IPA <laughs> okay 
but uh, this might be a clue or a cue to how you produce these two. So let me know, are you producing a dragon or dragon? Is there a difference between the two? You as native speakers might be able to uh, figure this out. Not a, not a native speaker of English, but I've tried producing these two, uh, which are uh, tree and tree. And um, with this respect, I uh, kind of uh, wanted to produce the first one as an aspirated consonant and the second one as affricated more. So we have this kind of two consonants like this, tree, tree, volume down tree tree and if you listen closely to these you might uh, capture the difference as in tr tr tree tree okay tr 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 this is the second one tr and this is the first one tr 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 yeah so tr there is there is slight difference in both versions of these two. All right, I, I'm keeping score. Uh, again, uh, we have uh, apertures, stops, fricatives, approximants, when one articulator is close to another, but without turbulent airflow and fricates, which are a combination of stops and fricatives. The dimension number five is retroflexion. A retroflex sound involves the curling back of the tip of the tongue, and it's because of this curling back of the tip of the tongue is generally produced in the post alveolar region. And retroflexion can occur to many, many sounds, especially those speech sounds in the uh, in the you know South East Asia um, and South Asia uh, with uh, Indian languages such as uh, Sindhi and uh, Hindi and so on and so forth. So. So these languages are likely to have retroflexion in their um, stop sounds. In um, English, there is only one retroflex sound, and that is er, er, er. The textbooks will are likely to transcribe this sound as like this, so simply like this. But I'll ask you not to do that because you are producing a retroflex with this curly Q-tip curly q-tip um, that indicates retroflexion so this one is good uh, you are also not to produce this one because as I mentioned maybe in one of our previous classes this one is R, 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 which is not used in English but in the majority world's languages it is so R, R is very is very common and you might uh, notice it when, for example, some Slavic people are speaking English, when they say very, very, or maybe some um, people from India and those parts, Nepal, uh, Pakistan, are speaking English when they say very, very. And so you, you will uh, probably notice that because this sound exists in their languages, in my language as well. In So as I said, here tend to reiterate the point in other languages stops and fricatives can be retroflex too and that's something to keep in mind so we are keeping score um, sounds can under you know can be retroflex there is only one in english and that's er and that is when the tongue is curled back into the post alveolar region now because we don't have um, a proper term for non-retroflex sounds we can use this term non retroflex sounds tongue not curled back so er is a retroflex sound and maybe let's say w is a non retroflex sound the mention number 6 is nasality uh, the back of the soft palate may be lowered or raised this may allow air to pass through the nose during speech and uh, when air passes through the nose during this, uh, the production of uh, any kind of consonants, we call them nasal consonants. Um, but it does not pass through the mouth in nasal stops. So in uh, nasal stops, we have 
for example, m, m, which is a consonant that is being produced with a uh, lowered, lowered velum, in order to air, in order for the air to be able to pass through your nose. So you're ba basically saying m, m, um, in nasal stop, as well as n, n, or m. Mm, mm, in angma. So uh, there is a bilabial, there is an, an alveolar and velar uh, nasal in English. Um, yeah, so basically the velum is lowered now and the air can go through and go all the way through the nose right so yeah nose when this little thing is uh, lowered vowels often become nasalized before nasal consonants uh, the diacritic for nasalization is this tilde uh, above the symbol. And examples are, for example, can, ben, cat, bed. Cat and bed do not have a nasal consonant, therefore their vowels are not nasal. And this is how they sound. Ben. 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 Uh, you can try and produce this vowel by saying Ben and then not producing the last N. Ben. 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 And you can, you can feel it's nasal in comparison to bed. E. 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 And you can feel the difference. Bed, bed, bed. Yeah. So you can listen to the ben, uh, ben, bed, bed. Before other consonants, n or n can drop out completely and leave the nasalization behind, such as can't, can't. Uh, in many words, it does. Um, I, I, I can't believe, or I, I can't believe, right? Um, in winters which is a um, uh, Dr. Winters' surname. So you have this tilde here, or you can drop N and leave the nasalization, nasalization behind, but no in cat, so no nasalization there. In Senna, uh, you may have also this tilde, uh, you know, this wavy uh, diacritic, and you get to, um, have Santa, 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 a nasal vowel, eh, 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 right? Produce it many times and you'll hear it. Okay, so one last time I'll play for you the video of Ken Stevens, uh, Ken Stevens' x-ray producing a bunch of uh, vowels um, and a bunch of uh, words and sentences. Uh, and I'll show you what to look for in order to notice or observe the lowered velum which results in nasal consonants and nasal vowels as well. So let's take a look. A hawk, a tea, a tip, a pear, a tear, a care, a pa, a ta. So at this point, when he said a pen, uh, you can see that the velum, this part here, is lowered, and uh, the air, air can go through it, right, and into the nasal cavity or in throughout through the nose, right. So let's take a let's listen to. A car, a dare, a nair, 
Hase, Hase, Hasa, Hep, Het, Heck, Hop, Hot, Hawk, A tea, A te, A ta. Yeah, fun, fun video clip. So, uh, the lowered velum is uh, right there, and uh, you can notice that it's it's being is being lowered and it's being raised for you know for producing a wide range of uh, consonants and vowels but most of the time it's raised at the right point at the right moment in order for us to produce or in order for can to produce um uh, central or non-nasal sorry oral non-nasal vowels and consonants and when you lower it you produce nasal consonants so yeah that would be the x-ray let's continue keeping score the sixth dimension is nasality uh, or nasality you can maybe produce this to, with a uh, flap um, whereby sounds can be nasal and the airstream is flowing through the nose with the help of the lower velum and the sounds can be oral where the airstream is not going through the, the nose with the help of the raised velum. So the velum does not allow the air to go through uh, nose in oral sounds. And they're called, called oral because of this, they, they go through the oral tract, no nasal tract, right? Okay, so we have kept score for that. Now we move on to laterality. Uh, lateral approximant in English is produced by the obstruction of the airstream at a point along the center of the oral tract. So l l l does does not allow the air's flow to go through the center of the oral tract, to, through the center of your mouth, through the center of your tongue, but to the sides of the tongue and the roof of the mouth. So we have alveolar lateral l l in English la, 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 la. and this l in English in my case as well but in most of your cases can be velarized for example all 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 um, velarized means that it is produced to the back of, of your tongue because of the raised uh, because it's raised towards the velum and this little tilde diacritic is used for Denoting, uh, denoting a velarized L or L, which is quite prominent in English. And uh, consonants which are not lateral are called uh, central, of course. Uh, so we have this distinction between lateral and central. And we will check out the oil video in the next, on our next slide, right? So here we will be listening to oil produced by Stefan again. And I will show you where you should do, what you should look for when um, looking at this um, ultra ultrasound um, image and video. Oil. 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 So basically, uh, what you what we are looking at is the tongue movement. So he is preparing to say oil, and you see here, tongue goes towards the, um, the alveolar ridge, but it's still in the towards the back of the mouth a little bit because of the influence of the uh, oil um, of this uh, vowel, right? So we have, you see here, back of the, of the mouth and going further front, but not too front to be uh, a regular L, right? As in le la 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 leaf, right? When you're trying to produce la 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 in leaf, you should uh, move the tongue uh, towards the front and 
when you're producing a dark owl or velarized owl you should move the tank back and yeah uh, so like this move it back a little bit uh, yeah that would be oil Dialectologically, O or L sound is a uh, most interesting consonant uh, in English because there or one of the most interesting uh, consonants in English because there can be a clear L, which is usually used a syllable initially in many dialects in many English variants, such as a leaf, leaf, l l leaf and dark L, which is used syllable finally uh, in feel, l, feel, right? And it might be, this might be the case with you, but you also might be uh, belonging to dialect type B, whereby clear L is used only before front vowels, but dark L everywhere, everywhere else, such as lock, 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 all, all, lock. And clear L might be used before front vowels such as leak, leak. Um, and finally, there can be maybe dialect type C where dark L is pretty much everywhere and maybe even lose the alveolar clo closure there, there because of the, uh, of the all which is produced to the back of the tongue, right? Um, as in uh, feel, oil, and so on and so forth. Leaf and feel in order to uh, illustrate this difference. So what you can do, oops, what you can do is go to new, record mono, sound, and produce um, these two. So I can do, for example, this. Leaf, feel, save and close the list so here they go I'll delete this part maybe this part and this part I'm using some shortcuts sorry about that but here it is leaf leaf so this is and this is another deal To hear how they sound, you can do the reverse thing, so reverse selection. Maybe you can hear it like this. Feel, feel, feel. feel. Yeah, and then uh, maybe even uh, so. Yeah, maybe re reverse back. Leaf, leaf, leaf. Okay, so reverse selection, and you can see, for example, this. Feel. Yeah, it's still, it's still to the, towards the back for me, not too much towards uh, front. Let's hear this one. Oops, no. Okay, now good. Yeah, too much of a creakiness here, but definitely towards the back. So my front is actually towards the back of the of the mouth. Uh, which I did not expect, but it is what it is. Yeah, and you, you know you can uh, uh, play around with these, record them, and hear. You can hear how you are producing. So, um, if I reverse the selection, so this is, and this is, right. So, there is there are some differences there as well. Okay, so that was feel and peel. All right, we are keeping score again. Based on laterality, sounds can be lateral or central. Uh, and I already explained what they mean. 
So to wrap up this lesson on constant dimensions, um, there can be, for example, two sounds, t and y. Based on the airstream mechanism, t is pulmonic aggressive. So the air is, you're pushing out the air out of your, of your lungs, y as well. Based on the phonation type, t is voiceless, y is voiced. Based on the place of articulation, t is alveolar and y is palatal. Based on the aperture, t is stop and y is an approximate. Based on retroflexion, t is non-retroflex and y is non-retroflex as well. So, uh, or based on aperture, it's clear that t is completely obstructing the airflow and y is not. Y is also called sometimes semi-vowel because of this um, non-obstruction that it has. So it has some vocalic um, and vowel-like features. So we have y, which is a proc uh, an approximant because the body of the tongue does not hit the uh, palate, but it goes close to the palate to create some kind of a, of a, of turbulence, but not too narrow turbulence to be a fricative, right? Um, based on nasality, of course, both are oral and based on uh, laterality, um, t is central and y is also central as well. Um, these four dimensions are usually subsumed under one name, which is called manner of articulation. Uh, but I'll tell you in the next slide why we, we should perhaps use these seven dimensions. Um, as I said, the phoneticians all across the world usually combine dimensions four to seven um, under the rubric of manner of articulation. So under one name, uh, manner of articulation. So example of a manner of articulation to would be an oral stop or just stop and nasal stop. So it's very important to distinguish between these two based on their nasality and orality, for example. Uh, v would be fricative, w approximant, l lateral approximant, and r retroflex approximant, and j affricate. So basically what they're doing is uh, subsuming all of these four dimensions and saying, okay, well, n is obviously, according to the manner of articulation, na nasal stop. So we have two dimensions here, nasality and uh, uh, aperture, right? Um, then l is lateral approximate. We have two dimensions here, laterality and aperture as well, and so on and so forth. You get the point. Um, the reason why we're using all of these is to easily distinguish between uh, all of the sounds. So we can have, uh, you know, retroflexion uh, included and uh, nasality and laterality and all of them, aperture as well as um, a kind of a more advanced or narrower um, contrast between the between the uh, between the consonants. Okay. Uh, final notes are that consonants or consonant sounds are generally assumed to be pulmonic aggressive, so the air is pushed out of your lungs. Oral, not nasal, and central, not lateral, right? And of course, non-retroflex, unless stated otherwise. The big picture thought through combinatorics, languages make uh, or language makes a large number of distinctions out of a minimal number of articulatory gestures, and this is where language and speech are very uh, potent. So they are very powerful in this way. Um, this is an IPA chart of English consonants. These are all English consonants. There are uh, out there, uh, maybe this approximate, let's say you can cross it out for now because we have this uh, R retroflex and that tap or flap is occurring. Yeah, okay, it can be here, but maybe you can put it in the in 
uh, brackets as well as global stop under parentheses because of uh, its dis distribution. These are mainly uh, L uh, LFOs and not really phonemes, but we have to have them in mind because many words in phonetic transcription will or phonetically will occur, will be produced with these two and you should uh, be able to transcribe them. So you should be able to transcribe all of the English consonants, you should be able to write your name in the IPA um, with by using these English consonants and uh, by using the um, uh, the um, software. Um, these dimensions uh, are also very important to remember and try to make sure to uh, learn them um, uh, f for describing because you need to be able to describe English consonants and consonants of the world. Uh, that's it for now. I will uh, leave you here and uh, see you next time when we will be talking about uh, some place or articulation.